Properly speaking, conversion is the turning away from one thing towards another. And on this channel, we talk a lot about conversion from Protestantism, from evangelical Christianity to Catholicism into the Catholic Church. And don't get me wrong, this story has that, but it has so much more. It has conversion through the power of the confessional, the sacrament of reconciliation, through the work of the Holy Spirit, through acts of vulnerability, of discipleship, of of walking alongside others who are suffering and struggling and being honest and open. It's the story of faith the size of a mustard seed and how God can take that small yes That small whispered, yes, I choose you, and grow that to an enormous faith and uh, relationship, life with God. This is an incredible story. I am joined this week by John Edwards to tell what I think is the most incredible conversion story that I have heard. I think you'll love it. It's one of those edge of your seat kind of stories. And As John unwinds this, I just got more deeper and deeper in it with him in this story. On the verge of tears, honestly, several times, tears of joy, tears of sadness, tears ultimately for the story that God can unfold in our lives through the Catholic Church, through our faith, through the sacraments, through our relationship with him, a very personal relationship in a church in which Christ gave us his body, his blood, the words, I forgive you in confession. This is an amazing, remarkable story. I think you'll love it. I hope that you do. Please listen. Please watch. Please enjoy. Hey, friends. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Just a reminder, if you're listening on podcasts, please leave a rating or review on on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify if you listen there. And you can watch us as well on YouTube.com slash The Cordial Catholic. Please do that. And we'd love to have you there and subscribe to that channel as well. This week, I am joined by John Edwards. It's going to be a fantastic content. He's got a great story to tell. He is the founder, executive director of Pew Ministries. I I love this. I love this from your bio, John. A Catholic apostolate with the mission of bringing the person of Jesus Christ to the person in the pew. That's fantastic. That's good. (laughs) I love that mission. John's a Catholic speaker and evangelist. He's spoken all over Canada and the U.S., featured in all kinds of places in Catholic media. He is the host of a fantastic podcast podcast called Just a Guy in the Pew podcast and the author of The Narrow Road, a monthly spiritual guide for men. He's also the co-founder of the Virtual Catholic Conference. John, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here and hello. Hey, it's nice to be with you, Keith. Thank you for asking me. I've been looking forward to spending some time with you here for a while and just excited about what the Lord's going to do with this time together, my brother. Oh, absolutely. I'm thrilled to have you and and very much looking forward to what we're going to unfold here. And so, John, this show is listened to by all kinds of people, but one of the audiences that I speak to a lot are these people who are non-Catholic Christians looking into the faith, new Catholics, maybe not even Catholic Christian to begin with, who are wondering what's going on with these wacky Catholics, <laughs> who do all kinds of weird things. You have a fantastic story, and so what I want to do, John, for, for a while is just kind of get out of the way and let you tell your story. You can start wherever you want to start and, and, and go wherever you want to go. And we'll stop along the way and kind of dig into a, a bit in, in different sections. But I want to let you unfold that for us and, and us to listen. So I'll shut up. I'll let you. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Where, where does it begin for you? Where does your faith journey begin, John? I mean, honestly, um, the it's as young as I can remember, honestly. I mean, that's the only way I know to say that. So, I mean, I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. I still live here. Um, you know, I was born and raised Baptist and I was, you know, from a young age on, I I love the Lord. You know, you can, I was surrounded by a certain community of people and we were kind of together all the way through, uh, our, our childhood, toddler, all that stuff, middle school, high school, and, uh, you know, into our, into our late teens. But I loved the faith. I loved talking to people about Jesus. In fact, you know, I went to an Episcopal school just because of the part of town we lived in. Uh, they didn't have the best public education. So my parents worked hard to send us to this private school. And so, you know, I was, I was even though I was Baptist, I went to an Episcopal school and now I'm Catholic. So I've kind of been <laughs> around the loop a little bit. But, uh, but yeah, I, I just, I loved it. You know, when I was at school, for instance, a lot of my friends would say on Monday, what did you do this weekend? And, and I'd say, well, I went to, you know, a 
vacation Bible school weekend, or I went to this, or I went to that. You know, we kind of got the eye, you know, the look like, what did you say? You didn't go skateboarding? Or <laughs> I was like, no, I, I, this is where my friends were. And you can go back and look at any of our parents' house and see, you know, pictures of us from like babies, toddlers, all the way through these stages. And, you know, we were going on mission trips and uh, vacation Bible schools, church camps, all of this stuff. Uh, I can remember going to all these big Baptist concerts and things. It was some of my favorite memories I ever had in my life. Um, and then we we got to the age of about 18. And, you know, that's when everybody started looking, or a little bit before that, looking to where they were going to go to school and what am I going to do with my life? And, you know, I was never a guy who knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to play in the NBA and play basketball. I'm six foot eight. Didn't work out. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But that's what I kind of wanted to do and, and realized, you know, in my late teens, that wasn't going to happen. But I started working at, at Napa Auto Parts at the age of 16. My father worked there for uh, 45 years of his life. And he just said, get off the couch and get a job one summer, you know. And so I did at 16. Well, around the time of 18, everybody, like I said, started looking at where they were going to go to college. And where Memphis is, it's in the Mid-South. So, you know, in the bottom left, of, I guess the southwest corner of the state of Tennessee, and it's touched by Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Kentucky. I mean, there's Georgia, all these states touch Tennessee. And, and we're surrounded by Southeastern Conference schools like Alabama and Auburn and Mississippi State, Ole Miss, Arkansas. So all of these kids' parents went to a lot of these different schools. And so a lot of the kids wanted to follow in their footsteps. So they were like, I'm going to Auburn. I'm going to Tennessee. I'm going to this. And like I said, I didn't know what I wanted to do. All of a sudden, one day, all my friends were gone. Well, the Baptist church I went to, there was no there was no groups between the age of 18 and my parents' age. So I'm in this church where I loved and was my community, where we had my community. But all of a sudden, there was nothing. There was no options for me. And so it was a very lonely time in my life. Uh, you know, I looked around and said, well, I guess I'll go to college because that's what you're supposed to do. So I enrolled at the University of Memphis. It was a commuter school here in town. It's the basketball team I grew up loving watching, you know, watching them play. And so I, en I enrolled and was continuing to work at Napa. Uh, my first couple months on, on, on campus were very, very lonely. I, it was the first time in my life I was surrounded by thousands of people and I didn't know anybody. You know, I was going to work and going to school and going to work and going to school. And I had no life. Uh, I had no friends to speak of. You know, I spent a lot of the time uh, trying to make friends. There were a lot of pretty girls in my class. I was trying to talk to them. But I uh, wasn't real successful in that. I don't know if it's because I look like this or what. I don't know. But um, wasn't real successful in that. So one day there was a girl in particular I was trying to talk to, and she wouldn't give me the time of day. But this guy came walking in with a fraternity shirt on, you know, a Greek lettered shirt. And she talked to him for the whole time, you know. And I thought, well, maybe I should get one of those shirts. So I did. I called the one guy I knew left in, in, in uh, Memphis, and he was ru the rush chairman for a fraternity. So he called me or I called him and he told me, uh, yeah, come on out. We're about to start rush season and, and see if you're a good fit. I mean, I, you know, you and I have always been friends. I think they'll like you. So I show up to some bar. I go through all this stuff and then they give me a bid. You know, they invite me to be a part of the to rush the fraternity. That was the last day I went to church for about 10 years of my life. Wow. Um, you know, I tell kids in high school, juniors and seniors, when I'm giving talks that, you know, freedom's a good thing because they're all looking forward to that. I'm about to leave. I'm going to go to college. I get to do what I want. I don't have to listen to my parents, that kind of thing. Well, freedom's a good thing if you know who you are. Yeah. And at that time of my life, very quickly, I forgot who I was when I walked away from church. So I started to look for people to tell me who I was, right? I wanted to fit in. I wanted another community and I want it very badly. I also had some father wounds I was dealing with too, looking for approval and, and things other places. So I joined this fraternity, I get in, um, and from there on, my grades went downhill. I eventually dropped out of college because I wasn't going. I was just partying all the time. Uh, I started doing what everybody wanted me to do. I'd moved up in my job, so I was making about 30 grand a year as a college kid with no bills. Everybody knew I had money, so all of a sudden, I was the guy that could buy booze, the guy that had gas in the car, the guy who had a car, the guy that could pay for people to get into clubs all those things. And so I became very popular and I thought, man, these guys really like me. Now, like I said, I was doing whatever it took. So a lot of the guys in the fraternity I wanted to be friends with, they did a lot of drugs. You know, they smoked weed, they drank, you know, pretty heavily. Uh, there were pills and acid and ecstasy. And I did all of those things. And then one night I made a very terrible decision in my life to do cocaine. Uh, I was over at a friend's house and you know, again, trying to impress people, trying to make friends. We were watching the NFL on a Sunday, had too much to drink. 
I was looking around the house for someone to drive me home. Memphis, you know, there wasn't Lyft or Uber yet. And, you know, Memphis was not the taxi capital of the world. So um, I was looking for a ride home. And I start looking through the house and I open the door to this bedroom. I hear voices and there's these lines of cocaine on the dresser. You know, cocaine was always the one thing I was like, you don't do that. Like that's, that's the after school special thing. You know, you do that, you're, you're, you die, you lose everything in your life. Something bad happens, but they convinced me, you know, Hey man, don't worry about it. It'll wake you up. Just do it this one time. You'll be able to drive home. I don't mean to blame them for my choices. I just gave in, uh, you know, where I should have stood my ground and left. I felt like I could run through a wall. I'd never done anything like that. It was like drinking 40 cups of coffee at once. And, you know, sitting in this on the couch, just, for about an hour after that, just sort of wigging out and, you know, just, you know, paranoid and everything else. Well, finally I got my, my vehicle. I was able to drive home and I said, I'll never do that again. Like that was dumb. I could see why this would be addicted to people. I'll never do it again. Well, Friday night comes along the next weekend and I'm at one of those guys' houses, a different one, same group of friends. And this time when I walk in, they're not hiding it. It's on the coffee table and everybody's sitting around doing it. And Again, I knew I should have walked out, but I wanted to be liked. I wanted to be a part of a community. I was looking for those things. So I sat down and I told myself I wasn't going to do any. Well, that lasted a very short amount of time and I was taking lines and I did quite a bit that night. And we went out to a club and we went out chasing girls and I paid for everything and all of that. Well, after that night, I said, I'll never do that again. You know, and I started to set rules in my life, these kind of unholy vows of I'll never buy it. I'll never have the guy's number. I'll never do it by myself. All of these things. Well, one by one, Keith, they all started falling. Yeah. You know, uh, they just started falling. I was working my way up in the company. I went from being this shipping manager, warehouse manager, to running a store and then eventually becoming an outside salesman. And that's really where I hit my stride. Um, I was really good at that. Uh, you know, all of a sudden my business started to grow. And I was making, you know, close to $200,000 a year as a 20 something year old kid. Um, from the outside looking in, people probably thought, man, that guy's got the world by the tail. He's got a house, he's got the car, you know, he's got the money, all this stuff. But I was a broken mess inside and nobody knew it. You know, as I said, I'd walked away from the faith and forgotten who I was. And as we started to do more cocaine, I started to break away from the going out and all that stuff and started to isolate. There's only a couple of us left that were actually even hanging out. And then I just started buying it all the time. And it was the loneliest I've ever been in my life. Uh, you know, I didn't have any ladies in my life, any women in my life. I was too afraid to approach anybody and I didn't want to leave my couch or whoever's couch because, you know, just too paranoid to go out and do that. So long story short, this one night I go out to this bar, my little sister's in town. She had gone to college out of, out of state and, or out of the city. And she was back in town and wanted to see some of my friends. So we show up at this bar and for some reason, all my friends want to leave early that night. I was sitting there going, man, I've got a pocket full of cocaine. I ready to party. It's Friday night. What are we doing? Well, all these guys leave except for a couple. My sister leaves and this beautiful girl comes in. I knew in college, she was actually a friend of my, one of my best friends for, you know, a long time. It was his girlfriend thought they were going to get married. You know, they've dated for five years and I was actually there the night they broke up. Um, and she was always my friend's girlfriend. And I'd seen her a couple of weeks before this for the first time in several years, but the interactions we had, she just like, I, I filled out a little bit, you know, probably had a, you know, crappy goatee or something at the time. She didn't recognize me. So um, she had been what I thought was rude for the couple times I'd seen her. She just didn't speak to me like she knew me. And she came in the bar that night. She spoke to all my friends before they left, didn't speak to me again. And I thought, what's with this girl? You know, why is she not talking to me? So I'm sitting at this table and one of my sister's friends that was there comes over and says, Hey, this girl over here wants to talk to you. And I said, Angela, what does she want? You know? And she goes, you know her? Yeah, I know her. Well, I don't think she knows that. So she goes back over there and then she comes back. She still wants to talk to you. So I go over there and sit down. I'm like, yeah, what's up? And she said, well, hey, how are you doing? And, uh, you know, I said, Angela, I'm fine. I've seen you three times lately and spoken to me. What's what's up? So we talk and talk, talk. Well, my two buddies that were still there were wanting to leave and go to a bar. So they come up and they said, hey, we're leaving, man. Just want to let you know. And I said, well, I'll go with you. They said, why would you do that? Like, you need to stay here. And I said, why would I stay here? Like, you're leaving. No one else I know is here. Like, I, I want to go party with you guys. Why would I stay here, you know? And he's like, no, you really need to stay. Like, no, I don't. Why would I stay? I want to go with you. And then he starts doing the neck thing. You need to stay. And I'm like, what? Why is your neck hurt? You know, and I turn around, I look, and my, Angel's looking at me. And I said, do you want me to stay or something? And she goes, yeah. And it hit me. I was like, oh, 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 she's interested in me. And then 
I was like, my best friend's going to, one of my best friends that used to date her is going to kill me. Like if I stay here. And <laughs> so anyway, we wound up talking that night and we had a great time. And then I asked her out the next night and then we continued to date. And a year later I asked her to marry me along the way. And the conversations we had, you know, she started asking me to go to church with her and I was in love with her. I'd do whatever she wanted. You know, I didn't really care for the Catholic faith. I mean, as a Baptist, I'd heard, you know, they worship Mary and they worship statues and it's the, of the devil and all this stuff. And so I was going with her, but I, I just didn't really think about the future. Well, one day in a conversation, she said, you know, the man I'm going to marry is going to be Catholic. And so I thought I was the man for the job. So I told her I was in and I asked her to marry me. And then I, her father was my sponsor and I went to the nearest RCIA class and I signed up, you know, thinking I was so chivalrous for giving up, chivalrous for giving up my faith for hers, my faith. I didn't even practice anymore, but we decided to get married and I'm thinking, this is it. Like, this is one of those moments in life where you mature, you know, you're, you're, this is where you grow up. God gives you these moments. And I thought I'm done. I'm not doing the drugs anymore. Well, didn't happen. I was doing the drugs the night before I got married. You know, um, I continue to do that after we were married, you know, I, I continue to grow at work and now I have the cars, the house, the beautiful wife, the money, people think I got the tiger by the tail, but I was a chameleon among men. You know, I was anything to everybody. I wore a mask everywhere I went. Well, Angela comes to me eventually about a year later and she says, uh, I'm pregnant. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is what I've been waiting for. And it's a boy. I always wanted a boy. You know, my father and I didn't have the greatest relationship. And I always wanted to give him what I felt like I didn't get. I didn't get. And I had all this stuff in my mind. I'm going to teach him to do this. I'm going to teach him to do this. It's going to be awesome. We're going to love Spider-Man and stuff. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> you know, and. And Jacob comes and he's healthy. I was so afraid he wouldn't be because I was doing the drugs, you know, and I was worried that would have an effect on him. Um, and luckily, by the grace of God, he came out healthy. Uh, he's 12 years old and, and just amazing today. Um, so that goes on. I'm thinking, all right, this is it. I'm going to change. I got a son. You know, this is it. I've got a, I got another life to care for. I, this is it. Didn't change. I went back to doing the drugs, you know, a couple of days after we got back from the hospital. Uh, it was shortly thereafter that I, I went to a doctor's appointment. My mom went to with my father. She uh, had breast cancer. It, it found, we'd found out about five years before. And she was in remission, you know, and it, nothing seemed to ever really seem like it was, you know, something to worry about. You know, every every report was great. I never went to the doctor with her. I didn't spend a whole lot of time at family stuff because I had to get back to the party. Well, this one day I was driving through Memphis working and I, I remembered my mom was up there at the at the clinic. They had moved to a farm that we had in Mississippi where both my parents were raised. I still had a house here in Memphis and they came up here to their doctor's appointment. So I thought I'll swing over there and see if they're still there. You know, I've never been to the doctor with my mom. So I go there, they're in there. I walk in, they're laughing and carrying on and I'm talking to them and they're surprised. Well, a few minutes later, this doctor walks in and I didn't know them. I'd never gone to an appointment. They introduced themselves to me and they said, well, I'm sorry to say, Miss Edwards, this has moved, uh, you know, from your, from your breast into your lymph nodes, into your lungs, and now into your brain. And you don't have much longer to live. You know, you have maybe two months to live. So my mother had started feeling real tired before this, uh, was having some, you know, issues with her heart and decided to go in and see a cardiologist. So this was before this doctor's appointment where we found out. They told her, you have three blockages, and one of them is a 98% blockage. So you know, if you don't, you have two choices. You have a heart surgery, but you have to stop chemo and the cancer can spread or, you know, you, you keep doing chemo, but you're eventually going to have a heart attack. So my mother chose the heart surgery and that's how the cancer spread. Never seen my father cry before. He was one of six kids raised on a farm. There weren't ever any I love you's or I'm proud of you's. You know, um, my dad was one of those, put your head down, never complain, don't have emotions, figure it out. You're not a man if you don't. And he broke down in front of me and all I could feel was just this despair and disappointment and hurt and anger. So I followed them to their house in Midtown. They were going to grab some clothes and go to another farm and got out of the car and, and what ran up to the car where my mom was. My dad had gone inside and put my head down in her lap and just started crying. You know, mom, I don't want you to live. I don't want you to die. I don't want you to die. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I've missed so much time with you. And why does this have to happen? And she's like, John, this is okay. Like I, I've been prepared for this. You know, I love the Lord and he loves me and, and we knew this could happen and you're going to be all right. And I didn't want to hear that. You know, I was like, I'm not going to be all right. And and my son's not going to have a grandmother and, and I don't want you to die. And, and what about my sisters? And they didn't know. I, like I was the first one to find out. And 
my father came back to the car and I didn't want to, I could tell he was a mess. And I just, my mom said, we're going to go, John, would you please call your sisters? I love you. And so I had to call my sisters and tell them my mother was about to die. Uh, and that was just the way to that was uh, impossible. <laughs> but uh, as soon as they pulled out of the driveway and I knew they were out of sight, I just ran up to the porch and I kicked the porch and I just, I started to cry and scream in anger and just said, Lord, I hate you. God, I hate you. If this is the God, this is if this is the type of God you are, I'll never worship you again. Why does a woman who has served you, you know, flawlessly her entire life have to die and a scumbag, drug addict, lying loser like me gets to live? If that's the type of God you are, I will never worship you again. I hate you. You know, I, I called my sisters. I told them um, it wasn't long after that that we were all at the farm and my mother passed away in the room with us. Um, and it just drove me into a worse addiction than I already had. You know, I didn't know how to handle it. I was immature. I was selfish. And that's what these drugs and, and all these vices do. They prey on an innate selfishness that we all have. You know, I'd never gotten over. Even when I was married, I didn't really fully live the vows I was supposed to. I was a terrible husband. You know, it was my money, my house, my this. Um, you know, I was a good father when I wanted to be, which wasn't very often. And so with the selfishness and this immaturity that I never grew out of, I just went into a downward spiral. I was drinking 20 beers a night, all the while excelling at work. So I was growing customers. I was making more and more money. I was the number one guy, not only in my area, but in the whole company. I was a Fortune 250 salesman of the year. And again, from the outside looking in, I was perfect you know, to people and had the life everybody wanted, the life you're told you're supposed to have. But I was a mess inside. Not long after that, Angela comes to me and she says, I'm pregnant again. And I get really worried because now I'm, I'm doing a 40 bag of Coke every night. I'm drinking 20 beers. I'm smoking a pack and a half of cigarettes a night. And our relationship is, is, is non-existent. We're like ships passing in the night. And I'm worried, oh my gosh, this is, this baby's going to come out, you know, really unhealthy. Like this is going to be what I, I'm going to hurt this child because of this. And I couldn't tell Angela because I was afraid she would leave me. So she tells me a couple months later, it's not one baby, it's two. We're having twins. So I'm proud to say today that I have identical twin, red-haired, blue-eyed, beautiful girls named Allison and Caitlin that are completely healthy. They're nine years old uh, by the grace of God. But after that, I just, I, I never matured. I wasn't a help to my wife. I, you know, I, I had this customer base. I was 100% commission. So the weight of my success was constantly crushing me. Because if I lost a customer, especially a big one, then we would lose our money. My wife worked at St. Jude's Children's Hospital and made a good living. But I kind of felt like it was all on me to provide uh, and to take care of my family. So I could go to work and be fine. But, you know, after work, it was nothing but a party. One night I'm sitting there and this customer had read a price sheet wrong and they got mad. And they were cussing me out and telling me they were going to take our business away. And they wouldn't answer my phone calls. And it's the largest customer I had. I sat there that night and Angela had gone to bed early nine o'clock. I mean, she put the kids to bed and just went to bed early every night because there was no use in trying to sit up with me. You know, we were sh two ships passing the night, like I said. So I'm sitting there, it's about two in the morning and I've been doing blow all night and drinking a bunch of beer and watching some baseball game on repeat. I didn't care about. Um, and, uh, you know, along the way, I wasn't going back to the bedroom early because I was afraid my wife might want to engage in the marital act and I wouldn't be able to because of the drugs in my system. So I developed a, a, an addiction to pornography alongside of all of this. I was watching porn every night before I went to bed. So I'm sitting there at two in the morning. I finally go back to bed. You know, when you do cocaine, it's very hard to go to sleep, especially as much as I was doing. But for some reason this night, I was able to go to sleep very quickly. Uh, I got in bed, fell asleep. About 20 minutes later, I woke up and my, my chest was just pounding. My heart was pounding out of my chest. I threw the covers off. I got up. I crawled to the bathroom, looked back to make sure my wife wasn't awake. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. thought I was going to die. I thought, this is it. This is this these moments you see in these movies. Like, I'm going to die. And so I crawled up on the commode and, you know, and I'm sitting there just hyperventilating and, and, and rubbing my arms and thinking I need to tell Angela to call an ambulance. But I, I didn't. I, I couldn't tell her. I was afraid that, that, you know, she'd find out why and then she'd leave me. I'd lose my house, my kids, her, everything. You know, I'd lose my reputation. And I thought about calling out to God, but I thought, no, I hate him. And I've turned my back on him. And he's he would never, you know, he would never let me come home. He would never love me again. So I just shoved my face in a towel. And, and I thought, man, if I'm going to die, I'll let it be quick. You know, and, and I was such a coward looking back, you know, more worried about myself than my family. 
Well, somehow I slowed my breathing. I realized I was having a panic attack and I crawled back into bed eventually after I slowed my breath, went to bed. I got up the next morning and thought, this is it. I'm throwing out all the drugs, everything. And I did. 4.30 the next day, I was back buying more. Uh, same thing, two o'clock in the morning the next night, pounding beers, doing drugs, go to bed, wake up, heart pounding out of chest, fall to the ground, crawl to the bathroom. Wife doesn't wake up. And I thought, okay, this is it. Like, I'm not going to get a third chance. I, I don't know if I am or not. And I wanted to cry out to God again, but I couldn't. My own pride, you know, that gets in our way so often in our relationship with the Lord. But I knew there was a Catholic men's conference coming up that weekend. I'd been one time before in five years previous. This was 2016. I'd been to one in 2011 with Father Larry Richards. My father-in-law had browbeat me into going. And so I finally went and um, I knew that I could go to the same thing and there'd be a bunch of priests for confession there. I'd been such a liar in my life. I had, no one knew the truth. So I thought, man, I can go to this thing. And at least I can tell somebody a priest can't say anything. So I go to this conference. I don't even remember who was speaking. And I go get up in the middle when it's time for uh, confession. I'm walking down the hallway doing the walk of shame, you know, looking at the doors going, nope, I know that priest. Nope, I know that priest. Nope, I know that priest. And I finally find one from out of town I didn't know. So I go in there, I open the door, and it's this kind of heavy set, older, crotchety looking priest. And I'm thinking, man, I really picked one here. He doesn't even look like he wants to be here. <laughs> And, you know, I sit down and he's like, begin. Well, I've been to confession once in 11 years of being a Catholic, and I didn't remember what you were supposed to do. I knew you were supposed to say, Father, forgive me, I, you know, whatever. But I didn't know what you were supposed to say at the time. So I tell him I don't know what I'm doing. And he asked me, you know, how long have I been Catholic? And I tell him, and he's like, you don't know how to go to confession. And I could already see how this was going to go. <laughs> so I just, he walks me through it. He's very irritated, you know, and I tell him, I start pouring my heart out. I'm crying. And it's like the biggest rush of like a waterfall coming out of me because this is the first person I could tell any of this to. And he can't tell anybody. It was such a relief. I'm crying and, you know, just ugly crying. And I finally said, I want to stop. I want to be the husband and father I always should have been, but I don't want to get in trouble. Well, he flipped out when I said that. This isn't about you not getting in trouble. This is about you wanting God's mercy and forgiveness. And blah, blah, blah. he starts yelling. And I was like, okay, man, last time I did this, I remember Jesus being much nicer, right? Like, I don't <laughs> I don't remember getting yelled at by the previous priests, you know, which are in persona Christe is what we believe in the person of Christ. So, you know, I finally said, okay, okay, okay. Like, just I want forgiveness. So he gave me absolution, which means he forgave me for my sins in the person of Jesus Christ in persona Christe. And I walk out. Well, I went home that night and I felt like a new man and I poured out the beer. I threw out the drugs and my wife probably thought, oh, great, this finally worked. Well, it did for four days. The following week was Holy Week. And uh, that Thursday, I had a customer call me. I had about a $250,000 equipment order I've been waiting for them to give me a yes on for a long time. They called that morning, said, bill it, you know, come down here, let me sign the invoice, order it, get it on the way. That was more money than I made all year in one sale you know, and I was halfway through the year. So I go down there, I do it. I'm excited. And I wanted to celebrate. And that meant one thing to me, doing drugs and drinking. I thought, well, I made that promise to God in the confessional like four days ago. Oh, well, I'll just do it this once, right? Just this once. So I'm driving from Mississippi where my territory was, my sales territory and coming back into Memphis and calling this drug dealer. He won't answer. He won't answer. I'm supposed to be going to pick up my son, Jacob, from my father-in-law's. All of a sudden this dealer calls me. I turn all the way back around and go back down to his house running, get my $40 worth of cocaine, get in the car, realize I'm on out of, almost out of gas. I'm not in a good part of town, as you can imagine. So I kind of gun it down the street to get to the gas station. And I pull up to the pump going, thank you. I made it. And I hear whoop, whoop. I look in the rear view mirror, rear view mirror behind me and it's the DEA. They pull them, the drug enforcement agency. So they pull me out of the car. They throw me up against it. You know, they yell, where are the drugs? They find them in my sock. They throw me in the back of a Tahoe, take me down to organized crime start grilling me about everything, then throw me back in the back of another patrol car and take me down to downtown Memphis to the jail. Now, Memphis is one of the most five consecutive every like consecutively, one of the top five most dangerous cities in Memphis for homicides and, you know, just, you know, hate crimes and all these things. So we pull up and it's these two officers. We're in this patrol car. We're waiting in this long line for them to bring me in. And I'm just freaking out, you know, going one, I'm worried about going in there Two, I'm worried about losing everything I'm going to lose. So this police officer looks in this rearview mirror and I'll never forget the way he looked at me. He said, dude, you don't look like you've ever been in trouble before. Like, what's your what's your deal? And I said, I hadn't I had never been in trouble before. I started doing stuff in college. It was stupid. I, I've been such a terrible person. And I just all I want to do is call my wife. It'd been three hours since I was supposed to pick up my son. And I knew she was probably worried to death. 
And he said, well, we're not going anywhere. I can get the phone out of the trunk and call her for you. And I just remember saying, well, I don't know what I'm going to say. I'm worried what she's going to say. And he goes, well, is this about you or is this about her? And it, just looking back on that now, it had always been about me, always. And so I just told him, I said, please get the phone. And he he held it up to my ear and she answered and said, John, John, where are you? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? And I said, Angela, I'm fine. I'm in the back of a police car uh, going into jail in downtown Memphis for the possession, the, the felony possession of, of cocaine. And there was just silence on the phone. And she said, I hate you. And she hung up the phone. She had her answer. She knew there was something going on. I had the perfect, you know, disguise with my mother's death. She just thought that I didn't know how to handle it you know, that I wasn't handling it well. And, and now she had her answer that was way more than that. But I was relieved that she knew where I was. And I put my mind on, okay, now I'm going to this jail and I I don't know what's waiting on me in there. So I get in, they take me in the jail. I'm sitting there till about four in the morning, surrounded by this huge room full of all these people they're bringing in. And I saw people fighting. I saw I get stabbed. I saw deputies beating down a guy, you know, all this stuff. I hadn't eaten in like 24 hours, hadn't had a shower, same clothes, do the mug shot thing. And at about four in the morning, they take me back to a pay phone and let me call my wife. I call her again. She answers and says, John, I know where you are and I don't care. You can rot in there. I've got to take the kids to school and go to work because you're not here. Uh, I hang up the phone and I'm starting to realize, man, everybody's going to find out. Everybody's going to know. So I walk back to get clothes and all this stuff. And they give me the scrubs and toilet paper and to, you know, toothbrush and all that stuff. I wear a size 16 shoe. I didn't really think they'd be able to do anything with that, but apparently <laughs> they have big shoes in jail. I can't get them at, you know, a store in town, but they got them there. I don't recommend you going there to get them, <laughs> but uh, so I'm sitting there and we, this is when it gets real, you know, you get in this line and you're going down this cell block and it's looks like law and order or something, you know, and I'm just praying I'm in a cell by myself. And it turns out I was, I get down to the end and, and the door opens real slow they tell you to turn around and this wrought iron door just starts slowly closing, just do, 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 boom. And all of a sudden the lock clicks. I'll never forget how that sounded. And I'm like, this is it for the first time since I was, you know, a kid, I can't, I can't go anywhere when I want to, I can't do anything. I can't eat if I don't want, if I want to. And so I turned around and looked at this small cell and this stainless, uh, stainless steel toilet and these dirty, nasty looking bunk beds and I just took a blanket out, threw it down on the bunk bed, laid down face first and pulled another one over me. And by the grace of God, looking back, I passed out. Well, I woke up a few hours later and I thought it was a dream. You know, I was still face down, blanket over my head because I was so exhausted. And when I sat up, you know, I was like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What a nightmare. I won't do this ever again. I, I get the message. I sit up and my head hits the bottom of, the, of a steel bunk bed. And I realize I'm not in at home. I'm in, a, in, in jail, that this is real. And so I throw my legs over the side of the bed. There's a cinder block wall about that close to my face. And I just start rubbing my arms going night and nothing again, like in the bathroom that night. And no, 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 no. This can't be happening. This can't be happening. Oh my gosh, I'm going to lose everything. Angel's going to leave me. She's going to take the kids. I'll never see him again. I'm going to lose my job, my house, my car, my money, my reputation. Everybody's going to find out. Everybody's going to find out. And I'm just steadily rocking back and forth and, I started to just feel my heart exploding out of my chest. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. And then I started to look around the cell to see if there was something to kill myself with. You know, I was just, I would rather die than face anything that I was going to have to face. I couldn't find anything. And all of a sudden, as I'm rocking night and nothing, I feel this strange peace come over me. And all of a sudden, I just slowly stop, you know, and I hear from my own voice, well, at least now you don't have to lie anymore. At least now everybody will know who you are. Those are the realest words I ever said in my life at that point. And it felt like the weight of the world, all this weight had been carrying from this house of cards that I'd built in my life. You know, everybody saw me as this, you know, good person for the most part and had all the success and the, the life and all that stuff. And every bit of the weight of that had been so crushing. You know, um, people ask me all the time about addiction. What's the worst thing? And yes, the drugs and the physical addiction stuff, but the lying, you know, just having to keep up with that all the time. And, so I sit there and, and, and next, you know, I just start to, to sob and I'm like, what have I done to my life? You know, and how am I, what's life going to be like after this? And, and how did I get here? Really? How did I get here in this moment? So I started thinking about that and immediately my mind went to the, the day that I walked away from my faith, the day I walked away from that Baptist church, because I'd never taken the Catholic faith seriously. I went under protest. Most of the time I was too hung over. I fought my wife on it. I was nowhere near the spiritual leader of my family. Um, you know, I was just, I never took the faith seriously after I joined that fraternity. 
So I just sat there and I started to remember the type of person I was growing up, you know, and how much joy I'd had and how I'd sought. I've been seeking all my life through all these different things, through being successful at my work, through drinking, through drugs, through seeking people's approval. And none of that ever made me happy. None of it ever really made me happy. It was always fleeting and gone in a moment. When the time of thinking all this and praying, I just started to, I put my hand, head in my hands. And I just started to cry out. I remembered all the things I'd said to God and to Jesus and just how much I hated them and all those things. And I just hit my knees and I said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It wasn't your fault that you didn't do this to me. I made these choices. I, I, all I want is just to, a chance to be a husband and a father, the one I should have always been. Please let me have that. If you let me have that, I'll do whatever you want. I'll give you my life. And I didn't even really remember what that meant. But I was like, I'll do whatever you ask of me. Well, shortly after that, the jail cell door opens. I stick my head out and they give me a phone call. And you have 30 minutes to take a shower or a phone call. I wasn't really interested in the whole shower thing. So I just said, you know, I'll make a phone call. And I call every person I knew, all those brothers for life and that fraternity I'd spent so much money on. Not a one of them answered the phone. It was, I was so lonely in that moment. Like it just, I thought this is my lifeline and I'm not getting out of here ever. Nobody will answer. My wife wouldn't answer. My family wouldn't answer. Finally, my, my dad, my sister answers at my dad's and she said, John, we know where you are. Angela called us. Uh, she's across the street. She's trying to bail you out. Uh, you're going to get out of there tonight at nine o'clock or so, but uh, you can't go home other than to get clothes. She's not going to be there. She'll have the kids at her parents' house and you got to go to dad's. You know, she just, she's not ready to, to see you now. And so all I was relieved, I was just relieved that I was getting out of there. So I go back to my cell and a few minutes later, they, they call me and say, you've got a, you've got a visitor. So I go into this law and order scene, the glass, the pay phones, and I'm just sobbing. My wife's there. She's sobbing my mother-in-law. And, uh, and she just looks at me and she goes, look, before you say anything, I'm not going to divorce you. And I was like, what, what? And she said, I'm not going to divorce you, but it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the vows I made to God that day in the church. All I heard was, I'm not going to divorce you. And that's all I was interested in at the time. So she gets up, says, you can't come home. I'll be at mom's house. You got to go get clothes. You're going to go to your dad's. Now I was arrested on Holy Thursday, right? This is the Thursday before Easter. And I come out of jail on Good Friday. So I walk out of this jail and I'm looking for my sister. It's not my sister, it's my father. And here I am, six foot eight, 270 pounds, way bigger than my father, but I'm like a four-year-old kid that broke something in the house. You know, I'm walking up waiting to get slapped in the face or, you know, punched or whatever. You know, I mean, my dad never did that to me, but that's what I felt, you know. And I walked up and I just had my head down. And I remember he, he looked at me and he said, John, are you okay? I love you. I would have killed to hear those words all my life. You know, I would have done anything to, to hear I'm proud of you or any of those things. And he just kind of grabbed me and I'll never forget what that felt like. He told me, let's go home. Let's get, let's get you clothes and let's get to the farm. And we had a two hour drive. It was the most real conversation I ever had with my dad. We talked about my mother, which we hadn't really done. He asked me if it was his fault, if he had been a bad father. And, you know, I was crushed by that. I, you know, he wasn't the father I wanted all the time, but he could only give what he had, you know, and he did he wasn't given much from his parents. So I, I just, we get down to the farm Saturday is, is an agonizing day away from my family. I haven't talked to my wife since the jail cell. I get up Sunday morning and I have this desire to go to mass, which I never did. I borrowed my dad's car. I went to this little Catholic room in the town. We were in a small town in Mississippi. There was actually a room that a traveling priest with, you know, traveling between four or five parishes. You never knew if he was going to be there. And they had a sister that would distribute communion, you know, and do communion services if he wasn't. So I pull in the parking lot. It's Easter morning and nobody's there. And I start flipping out. I'm like, really, God, the one time I want to go to mass in 10 years and and I can't. And I'm sort of beating the steering wheel and I'm crying. And next thing you know, uh, this nun, the sister pulls in and she's looking at me like, what's the matter with you? And I'm like, I just want to go to mass. You know, I'm crying and screaming. She's like, OK, it's down the street, you weirdo. You know, it's, <laughs> there's too many people here, you know. And so I go down to this place. She tells me in the next town we'd had family reunions there and and I walk in and it's packed full of people and their kids and families. And, you know, there's a potluck afterwards and I'm just sitting there. My heart sinks because I'm the only one there without my family, you know. And all of a sudden this priest walks in. I'd met one time five years before at this little Catholic room. My wife made me go to Christmas mass one time as a prerequisite for going to my dad's on Christmas night or on Christmas Eve night. He gives these this wonderful mass, you know, homily in English and Spanish. And it's beautiful. And I feel the Lord tugging at my heartstrings. I get up and I, I want to leave immediately because I just don't want to get asked to stay to this potluck. It was just too hard to 
you know, I knew my, my, my wife had a big Italian family and I knew they'd be meeting after their church services in Memphis and she'd be walking into one of their houses and the roar of voices would suddenly go <gasps> because of the elephant in the room. And I just, it was such a horrible feeling. So I just wanted to get out of there. And I reached for the door and all of a sudden this hand hits my shoulder and I'm like, who's touching me? I don't know anybody in here. And I turn around and it's this priest and he says, hello, John. He remembered my name from meeting me for two seconds, like five years before. And he said, I don't know why you're here alone or where your family is, but God wants me to tell you everything's going to be all right. And he looked at me, he said, I hope to see you and your family again real soon. And he just turned and he walked off. I mean, my, my, my jaw was on the floor. I walked up to the car and I'm like, how could he know? Like, how could he say that to me? What do you mean? God says everything's gonna be all right. And I just sat there and I, I said, you know, this is a sign. Like I've, I, I'm going to be different. I'm going to change my life. So I went to Memphis the next morning with my father. I went to court and pled guilty and went through this process where I went and took drug tests every month. And if I did successfully, you know, testing negative, then um, I would, I would, you know, it would be washed off my record. So I did that. I went to work because my job had found, you know, they found out about me being arrested. So they had all kinds of questions and I made my mind up that I wanted to, check myself into a behavioral science center. I wanted to see how bad this was. I wanted to prove to my wife that I was serious. Court didn't make me go. So I go into this work meeting and they're peppering me with questions and I'm just going, no, yes, no, yes, no, 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 no. Finally, they stopped me. They said, you have to be somewhere like you could lose your job. You don't understand how serious this is. I said, look, I've been here 23 years. I've never been in trouble and I've made you a bunch of money. If you fire me, you're going to fire me. I can't do anything about that, but I want to go down to this behavioral science center because I got to get my family back. And so I got in the car, I left. My dad was with me there. He had to walk in this building where he'd worked for 45 years and walk in there with his son with everybody knowing. So he takes me down to this, this drug place and rehab place. And I go in and I ask him to stay in the car because I knew what was going to be in there. I'd picked up a friend there before from DUIs and things like that or from alcohol problems. So they take me in this waiting room and I'm sitting there and, and these families are just bringing in their sons, their daughters, their fathers, their, you know, and just throwing them in the room and saying, take them, take them, take them. You know, they've, they've, they stole from us. They took all our money. They wrecked the car. They, there's enough's enough. Right. And these people were just, some of them were coming in just scratching their skin, you know, and bleeding because they were on meth and thought they had bugs on them or something. And so I finally just pick up a, a paper that's laying beside me and, and just, I'm not even reading it. I'm just holding it in front of me so I don't have to see it because the door where they're coming in is right over my shoulder. Well, eventually the door opens and nobody walks by. The paper didn't billow or move or anything. And I, I lowered the paper. I look up and it's my wife. And I haven't talked to her since Friday. And I said, Angela, what are you doing here? And she said, John, I'm mad as hell at you, but I can't let you go through this alone. And she sits down with me. I go get assessed. The lady says that, you know, she needs me to, that I'm going to be in a 30 day outpatient, which my wife totally didn't agree with. She was like, put him under this place. Is there like a torture chamber or somewhere you could put him for <laughs> good six months and work this out of him, you know, but no, they said he needs to come here every 30 days, you know, every day. I mean, for 30 days. So I'm leaving and I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be terrible for my dad. You know, he's going to have to drive me two hours one way, you know, twice a day for 30 days up here. So I can go to this. And I go outside and I look and he's not there. And, and Angela said, what are you looking for? And I said, my father. And she said, John, I told him to go home. He can't drive up here like that every day. And the kids and I need you. Um, you know, Allison asked, who was three at the time, one of my twins, she asked if you were dead because she hadn't seen me for four or five days and she'd never gone that long without seeing me. She said, look, I can't do all this by myself. I'm not happy with you. We are not okay. I'm not sleeping in the bed with you but I need you to come home and at least do things to help me with the kids. So I go home, I walk in and I'll never forget. Like we had a den on the back of the house and my three kids were sitting there watching Barney or something. And I come in and I, I just, they're daddy, daddy. And I hit my knees and just, they tackle me. And, and I, I realized that moment, how much of their life I'd already forfeited, you know, how much of their life that I should have been a better father and, and that I would never let anything like that happen again. So we sit there, we hang out all night. I, I go back to go to bed and Angela's not in our bed. She's in Jacob's across the hall and my side of the bed looked right across at his bed. And she was under the cover sleeping with him in there. And, you know, I always used to say, I saw the lump of her. She doesn't like that word. So she said, use the shape or something <laughs> like that. So I'm sitting there in my bed, like king of the castle. I'm home again, right? And everything's great. And I can, you know, I've got, I've got food that's not pig slop. You know, there's air conditioning, there's TV, there's all this. 
And I'm smiling like, yeah, I'm back again. I turn around, I look, uh, look at the side of my bed that's empty. And I thought, this can't go on like this. Like, I can't just not do drugs and alcohol. i got to change my life. So at that men's conference I mentioned in 2011, Father Larry Richards gave me a book called Be a Man that he wrote. I had that book. I was going to change my life back then, you know, underline three pages worth of stuff. And um, it didn't work, obviously. So I, I in the bed right then, I'm thinking I need to do something spiritual. And to me, as a former Baptist, that meant get in the scriptures, right? Like start reading the scriptures. So I started looking for a Bible. I can't find one. She looked on my wife's side of the room. There's probably 40 of them over there. <laughs> but instead, I find Father Larry's book and I start to read it again. And I read it from cover to cover that night. I got up at six in the morning or at six in the morning, Angela gets up and she's like, what are you doing up so early? And I said, I never went to sleep. I read this book all night. I'm starting to understand what it means to be a man and what I've forgotten and the man I used to be and all this stuff. Well, she was like, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, the other shoe waiting for the other shoe to drop for a very long period in our life. There's a lot of healing, but I started reading the scriptures every day. I read like 60 Catholic books in my first year. Just, I, I couldn't get enough. Once I started getting into the scriptures again, uh, I went to to drop my kids off at school one day and the world kind of crashed in on me. I was still in my father-in-law's truck that he let me borrow because mom was impounded. Uh, I was sitting in the parking lot. And my customers, customers found out about what had gone on. They were questioning me and I wasn't allowed to tell them anything because it works that I couldn't until after my court date. So I'm getting texts like you bleepity bleep bleep bleep. You're a crackhead. You're this. I'll never buy from you again. So I just feel like, okay, not only if I ruined my reputation, but now I've ruined my financial situation for my family. And I just began to cry and thought, is my life always going to be like this? Like, this is what I'm going to be to everybody, you know, from now on. And all of a sudden I see my parish priest walk by, you know, the pastor. And, and I knew where he was going. I knew he was going to 815 Mass. And I thought, well, I want to hide and nobody will look for me in there. So I go and I, I open this door and I feel so hypocritical. And it's a couple older men and women that are retired. It's 815 Mass. I, I walk into the Joseph side and I sit down and I'm so nervous because I don't even really know the responses or anything because I've never been a good Catholic. And Father comes in. He reads the readings. They start speaking to me. By the end of the gospel reading, I'm, I'm in tears. I mean, it's just like waterworks down my faith, face. He starts his homily, and it's almost directed directly at where I was in my life. I started sobbing uncontrollably. I mean, it was disturbing in the church, but I couldn't. I was afraid to move. I didn't know what to do. He goes over and starts the liturgy of the Eucharist, and eventually he calls us up for communion, right? And I'm the first one on the Joseph side, the only one on the Joseph side. And so he's just looking at me and I, you know, he's like, he just nods his head and I went, uh, uh, and he nods his head again. And I was like, uh, uh, I knew one thing about being Catholic. You don't need to go to confession. I mean, go to <laughs> take the Eucharist if you hadn't been to confession. So I'm sitting there going, no, no. And he just finally goes, come here. And I'm full waterworks, just sobbing. And he came up to me. I got a Holy spirit coin in my hand, but he came up to me or when I walked up to him, he he looked at me and he said, this is the body of Christ. That was the first time that I ever believed it. When that touched my hand, it felt like there was electricity shot all over my body. And I took it, and then he nodded towards the cop, and I told him no, and the same thing again. And he looked at it and said, go go take the cop. So I went, and I took a sip. You know, I, I partook in the blood, and I went back to my pew, and I hit my knees, and I prayed harder than I think I ever have in my life. I couldn't tell you what I prayed. All I know is they had processed out, and Mass was over. And all of a sudden, I feel another hand on my shoulder. And I look up, it's another priest. And he said, hello, John, what are you doing here? Which was a valid question because I didn't go to mass on Sunday, let alone on a weekday. <laughs> and he saw my face and he said, come with me. So I started looking at where we're going. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm tracking and we're going to the confessional. And I thought, I don't want to go in there. Last time I went in there, I was arrested. You know, I don't, <laughs> don't, I don't want to do that again. But I walked in and I just started sharing my heart with him. And I kept trying to beat up on myself. You know, and, but you don't understand, Father. You don't understand. You don't know what I've done. You know, God can't love me. And he's like, look, God can love anybody. And he certainly loves you. And we're not going to beat up on ourselves. We're moving past this. And so as much as I try to beat up on myself, he wouldn't let me. He really showed me the mercy of God in that moment in my life. So he gives me absolution. I get up to leave and, and he tells me to sit back down. And I was like, Father, I've only done this a couple of times. And I think this is when I'm supposed to leave. He says, no, sit here and listen. I don't have a lector. You notice I had to read the readings. So you're going to come lector every day. He said, uh, you don't have to be at your class every day until 1030. So you're going to be at 815 mass every day. 
And oh, by the way, you're going to come to confession every Friday until I tell you any different. That priest saved my life. Huh. He's one of my best friends to this day. I love him to death. He's a, almost a grandfather of my kids. He is just, he's over at my house almost every weekend. He's just become an amazing friend. And he walked with me through this journey. So it's been about a year. Nobody knows in my life, but my family and my job, you know, um, nobody in the parish. My wife asked me to get involved. I joined the men's club, which is basically a beer drinking and barbecue cooking, you know, fundraising thing of the church and the, in the school. No one knew that that men's conference came up where I'd gone to confession the year before I went and there was a young man there that was from focus, focus missionary that shared his story. And it was similar to mine. It inspired me. And that night we had an event at the parish uh, and one of the guys from my parish that had been at the, the conference, he was there and he had been to confession for the first time in 20 years. He was running around this gymnasium. We had a three point shootout thing going on. And he uh, and he was running around screaming his sins and all this stuff. You know, he was like, man, I went to confession today. Whoa. And I told him this. And I told him that. And I was like, hey, man, you need to calm down. <laughs> like some of the stuff you're saying in here is not for the ears of women and children. Like you just ixnay on the shower, eh? you know, and all that stuff. And and uh, he's just like, man, I don't understand why I feel this way. He, I said, dude, you've had a you've had a moment with the Holy Spirit. You said you've been to confession for the first time in 16 years. He says, well, dude, I don't know. What does that mean? Like, I know God, I know Jesus, I'm a cradle Catholic, but I don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. And so I started to tell him and I felt the devil smack me in the face. What are you doing? You cokehead, you crackhead, you're going to you gonna tell somebody else about Jesus? Really? Look at the life you've lived. What are you going to share with somebody about Jesus? You walked away from him. And so I shut up. I said, Jay, I, 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 you know, the priests are over there. You need to talk to them. But no, I, he said, no, I want to talk to you. You're talking in this, this everyday way, man. I'm, I'm understanding this. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not your guy. And he kept on and kept on. And finally, I just said, fine, fine, we can go to dinner. So that next day, I, I go home. I, I told Angela, you know, that night when I got home that somebody wanted me to talk to him about the Holy Spirit. She's like, okay, <laughs> you? And I said, yeah, I mean, I, I guess. So I got home from Mass Sunday, and I, I pulled out my Bible. And next thing you know, I had six, seven legal pages full of the Holy Spirit, from the breath over the water, the Ruah, all the way through Pentecost and beyond. So I showed up, and I met Jay that night, and I – just went through all of it. And he said at the end, he's like, wow, this is amazing. You should start a men's group. Well, same thing again, Jay. I can't, I can't, I can't. All my shame. I, I felt that was the sum of my sins, right? So he kept asking, why do you always tell me no? And I said, Jay, I just felt convicted by spirit. I said, I was arrested for on a felony charge of cocaine a year ago, man. I'm not your guy. And he just looked at me. He's like, wow, that's amazing. You should start a men's group. I thought he was going to be like, check, you know, and I was like, dude, what's the matter with you? Are you on drugs? Like, did you not hear what I said? But he convinced me to. And a week later, we called about 30 men from our parish and school. Some I knew, some he knew together. And we didn't tell them why they were there. I walk up that night. I'm scared to death. I've told my wife I'm going to tell these people. She's not happy about it. But I feel convicted. I have to do this. It's a time of year where it's dark outside at like five. So I walk up and I can see all the men in the room, but they can't see me. And you could tell they're like, where is everybody? What are we doing here? They're irritable. You could just tell this was going to be a tough situation. I touch the door and all of a sudden I hear, what are you doing? What are you doing? You go in there, you're going to lose everything. You go in there and tell those men what you told that guy the other night. They're going to kick your kids out of the school. They're going to kick you out of the parish. Think how embarrassed your wife's going to be. They're going to realize what a loser you really are. You're going to lose every friend you made in your life in the last year. And so I let go of the door and I turned away. I got about three steps. And all of a sudden I heard what you hear in the Old Testament, a small whisper. God's not in the earthquake or the, the storm. And I heard this voice say, John, you told me when you walked out of that cell, you were going to be different. Turn around and open the door. It's what I felt in my soul. I don't ever claim to hear an audible voice of God. But I turned around and I opened that door and I walked in there and all these guys were like, dude, what are we doing here? There's no beer. There's no nothing. Well, Jay was supposed to be there with beer and he showed up late. I didn't know he was always late. <laughs> so he comes in and gives everybody beer. And I stand up and I say, look, we got a great men's club here. We do a lot of great things for the parish and school, but we never talk about Jesus. And let me tell you what can ha what happens in your life when you don't do that. And I went, blah. And I just shared this long, drawn-out story I've just shared with you and all the people that are probably asleep right now. <laughs> They're watching this, listening to me. And I was crying. I was a nervous wreck. I was, I was waiting for people to just get up. Finally, I get to the end of it, and I said, look, I know I can't be the only one that's broken. I can't be the only one that struggles. I think we should start something for men here that's spiritually based. I don't know what I'm doing, but I, I, I'll, I'll try to help any way I can. If you want to leave, leave. This is an entrapment. You didn't know why you were here, but if you want to stay, then we're going to start something for men. And I sat down and I just, I felt like I'd been hit by a truck. You know, I mean, I just left everything on the table. All of a sudden, Jay, the guy that asked me to do this stands up and I'm like, really? 
you're going to be the one that leaves. You're the one that got me into this. You know, <laughs> it's just looked up, but he was crying. And all of a sudden he says, I'm a terrible husband and father. I care more about my job and money than I do my family by the way I spend my time. And he sits down. The next guy gets up and he says, I'm addicted to pornography and my wife's going to leave me. The next guy gets up and he says, I'm drunk. I Ubered here. I fight with my wife. We have nine kids. My job thinks I'm at home sick. My wife thinks I'm at work. I've been in a hotel room all day drinking a case of beer. I thought we were drinking more. That's why I'm here. All the way around this room, men got up and down like pistons in an engine and started pouring out everything that was broken in their life. And that's the night, Keith, that God showed me the power of vulnerability, you know, the power of vulnerability in people's lives. St. Paul, you know, he asked God three times to remove the thorn from his side. And uh, God tells him, no, my power is made perfect in weakness. That's in 1 Corinthians. What did this mean? What it means is we need God, right? When we try to white knuckle our lives and when we try to control the steering wheel of our life and we try to do these things, we find ourselves in these vices and addictions and these places of great torment because we're not meant to control anything. We're meant to humble ourselves, right? We're We're meant to understand that we need God. And that where the world tells men that like, no, the world has a definition of vulnerability that's, you know, vulnerability means you're susceptible to attack, you're weak, you're less masculine. And we buy into that and we have that mentality of I need all this stuff in the world and I need to prove to everybody who I am and what I am. You know, I don't need to have emotions. All the things I talked about my father, you know, kind of portrayed, you know, walk around the world like a one man army. But God tells St. Paul, no, my power is made perfect in weakness. St. Paul understands that in that moment and he goes on later to say, if I'm to boast, let it only be in my weaknesses, my hardships, my difficulties. Because then when I'm weak, I'm strong. And so we started a group that night six years ago. It'll be March 23rd is when I was arrested. So six years ago in two weeks will be when that men's group started. And we've met every Wednesday since except for Christmas and Thanksgiving. And we show up and it, we created a place where men can take off the mask and they can be vulnerable, right? Where they can share their lives and they can be real, you know, most people long for that in their life. We we all have these Facebook, you know, accounts where we're all sitting there with the kids and we're all dressed up like elves <laughs> at Christmas and everything looks perfect. We're smiling. But everyone knows that, like, that picture didn't happen that way. They were screaming and yelling. Kids were getting grounded and mom and dad were mad at each other for a day and a half. All so we could present to the world that everything's fine when we all know we're broken. But we act like we're not. And then we spend all this time and energy and stress trying to pretend that we are. We found out that night that, look, we're all broken and God loves us anyway. And we're not the sum of our sins. We're the sum of his love, right? His love is a free gift and our worth. We're worthy because he says so, period. We're beloved sons of the father the same way in our baptism that Christ, you know, when Christ was baptized, he said the same thing to him. It wasn't just for Jesus. Jesus was God. He didn't need to be baptized. He did it for us so we could be reconciled to the father. And so we understood that that night, you know, I started this group, men started coming from all over the parent, from all over the diocese. We had Protestants show up and then they became Catholic. And then we had nine people become Catholic in the first year. And we weren't catechizing anybody. We were just introducing them to Jesus, to men who loved each other and were there for each other as real authentic friends, which people long for in this world. We think the friends at work, the guy in the cubicle next to us are authentic friends. Most of the time it's a friendship of convenience. You know, you move or change jobs. You're probably not going to be friends, you know, very much longer. That's the way it goes a lot. So we started to understand this. And I was asked to speak at that same men's conference. And I got up in front of a thousand people and poured my soul out. I went to work for a ministry called Cardinal Studios and sold the Rise program with Chris Stefanik, traveled the country, sharing my story, uh, worked for them for about two years. And then uh, we parted ways with each other and I decided to start a nonprofit. My wife asked me to, said, why, why don't you do that? She's an angel. I was like, what do I know about that? I don't know how to run a business. And here we are two years later with a, a, a podcast that I started when I worked for Cardinal, a deacon here in town that has the Catholic Cafe uh, radio and podcast on EWTN. Uh, just told me, he said, I've been listening to what you've been doing in this men's group and I think the world needs to hear it. And I didn't know a thing about podcasts, and I certainly didn't think anybody wanted to listen to me. (laughs) So we did that, and here we are. I just before this show did, I think, episode 150-something. And, you know, now we're going around the country, and we're doing parish missions, and we're helping start men's groups just like what we did. And that's that's my story. The long-winded end of it, that's that's what happened. And I learned that night that, that God wants us home, that we're all prodigal sons, and just like the father and the prodigal son, he'll welcome us home. We just have to turn back to him and realize his mercy and his love is there 
that it's not what the devil teaches us or tries to convince us in our head that we're not worthy and we're unlovable. God, there's nothing we can do to make God not love us. And 90% of the time, a hundred percent of the time, we're the ones that turn from him, not the other way around. God waits for us. If we just humble ourselves and turn back and, and let him love us the way that he wants to in our life. <laughs> Sorry, it took so long. <laughs> John, that that is such a story. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know where to begin yeah. to unpack that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, first yeah, of all. Yeah, my pleasure. That is incredible. Uh, you have the award now on this show for the longest uh, <laughs> unbroken guest talking on this show. Sure. So congratulations. Thank you for that. That's. Well, <laughs> no, that's, that's a good thing. But thank no. you. No. <laughs> well, you said you said you put us to sleep. We're on the edge of our seats, John. We're on the edge of our seats yeah. listening to your story. I mean, that is so captivating. I want to. I mean, we can't unpack everything in there, but I do want to dig into some areas because it, it's, it's so fascinating to me. I want to begin with confession, like that. Sure. There's obviously some real, real points of, of of power in confession for you in, in your journey. Uh, I I think of I, mean, I laugh when you mentioned this this surly priest that you first encountered. <laughs> I too was at one of these big uh, Catholic conferences, and we had this time of confession, and there was like you know a hundred priests all down the aisle. This uh, this uh, huge convention center in Detroit, Michigan, and. I remember seeing this. I, you know, we're heading up in the line, and I'm next, and who's gonna who's gonna be the guy that's gonna uh, I'm gonna go to? Sure. And this priest walks by, going to his chair with this great big old stole from like the 1970s with like a rainbows <laughs> embroidered in it and like a Noah's Ark scene. And I thought, oh please, Lord, not him, not him, anybody but him, because he looked like he was just gonna be really out to lunch when I when I and I wanted a good confession here John and, sure and of course you know where the story is going I get up the line and of all the of the hundred priests that are there in the convention center in the hall I I, I go to this guy I think oh my God, come on uh, Lord of, of of all the priests like I'm gonna go with the guy who's gonna be a bit a bit you know different because he's got this crazy stole on and I'm thinking <laughs> what's he gonna say to me but John I didn't have huge sins on low but I was at this I was at a, a, a turning point in my life, trying to figure out what to, what to do next with my life and some pretty big decisions. And he gave me, you know, one of the best confessions and some of the best pastoral advice I ever had in my life. And and turn that mirror on me to realize, well, I shouldn't be judging anybody like I was this guy. Because look at the how, how, how God worked through him, despite me thinking, oh, no, not him, Lord, not him. <laughs> so I, you know, confession is one of those incredible fruits of the faith, right? And I, I, I often, I, your fantastic story that you've unfolded here, I think, is maybe the apologetic that I was looking for, I was waiting to share with my audience to explain how powerful confession can be. Because one of those things that's hard to pin down, hard to explain to a non-Catholic who hasn't experienced what confession can do, right? And mm -hmm. I mean, it's not as if you walk out of there and never sin again, because that wasn't, that wasn't your experience, Right initially, but there is that that power of of a priest. We believe speaking the words of Christ to you to say you are forgiven. Hmm. Can we can we unpack that a little bit more? Especially when you are carrying things that are so heavy, uh, sure. you know, as you were. What's it like to to hear somebody and believe that they actually have the power to do that, right? Based on what we read in the scriptures, like sure, you know, you, you know scriptures as, as a Baptist, yeah, right. We, we believe that the power to bind and loose what what Christ was giving those apostles was that power to to mm -hmm. loose those sins. What's that like to hear that from somebody? And, I mean, it, it's. It's amazing. I mean, as a former, I talk about this a lot, as a former Baptist, you know, whatever I was doing as a kid, you know, it was nothing like what I eventually got in myself into. But whenever I would do something wrong, you know, I would just, God, I feel guilty. Please forgive me, you know. And there was always this, and I didn't realize it really until after I became Catholic, but there was always this feeling of, how do I know I'm forgiven? Like, I mean, I know they say that the blood of Christ covers all sins and like, but it just didn't always, it didn't ever seem right to me. It's like, so if that's the case, then can I just go about my life for the rest of my life doing whatever I want and like go kill somebody or something like that. And it's okay. Cause Christ is going to forgive me, you know? And, and, and when I became Catholic, I realized like, no, there's, we have a role to play in salvation and, and yes, Christ, his sacrifice opened the door for us to be reconciled to the father, right. Him giving himself 
on the cross and, and, and taking our sins upon him. But he gives us these gifts in the church, these sacraments and confession. It's just like, man, it really shows me how much God the Father loves us. Yeah. Because let me put it this way. In a, in a lot of Protestantism, especially you know being Baptist, there's always the, the, the onus on the personal relationship with Jesus, right? You got to have that personal relationship. Well, nothing says that God desires a more personal relationship with you than a God that says, you know what? I don't ever want you to worry that you don't have my forgiveness. Yeah. I don't want you to go through life with this you know, burdening you down and you falling further into sin because you feel like, what, what's the purpose? I'm never going to be forgiven. He cares so much about you not doing that, that he physically puts someone in the room to tell you you're forgiven. That is one of the most personal ways a God could show you he loves you. And so when I was, you know, when you're in there and you know, you can go and you don't treat the confessional like a, like a drive through window, right? You're not picking up an order of fries and a burger. You're going in there with true remorse. I mean, this is what it means when Jesus says, repent, like repent and believe in the gospel. Repent is to turn from. When we go to confession, it, it's to help us understand what's the root of these sins. Like, why do I keep doing it? You know, if you're watching pornography, for instance, and you're struggling with that, you're going to go confess that. But there's a root below that that, that that is being lived out, acted out in pornography. Yes, that is a sin, but what's driving that? Confession helps us to identify yeah, that. Yeah. But it also, we give it to God, and then we do our best to turn and leave from it. Doesn't mean you're not going to fall. Doesn't mean you're not going to fail, and you're going to struggle again with that or something else. But each time, we have this gift, and it's our response, right? It's our response to that gift to do our part and say, I, I've, I've sinned against the Lord. I've, I've done things that I know I'm not supposed to. Now I need to go say I'm sorry. And so many people, get they're, they're afraid of confession because they have this mindset of, of um, well, I don't want to go tell God what I've done. Well, if we believe that God has a plan for our life and that God loved you into existence, then he knows everything you're going to do before you were ever even born. So he knew you were going to do it before you were born. He was there when you did it. And now as a loving father, he's offering you a chance to be forgiven, right? To be forgiven. And, and that's why we don't need to look at confession as this, like, it's a punishment, you know, because some people can't. I got to go in there and face the music, right? It's not that. It's a loving father and, and a loving brother in Jesus welcoming us back to take those burdens off of us so that we can be the people that he calls us to be. You know, that's just one of the many. I mean, you're talking about confession with the Eucharist. I mean, there's we could talk all day about how personal Jesus wants to be with us and how much of a loving God he is. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic, John. And I think too of that priest that that wanted you to come back to confession. Well, first of all, got you involved in 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 the mass in the parish. That's a whole other important topic to dig into. But sure. who wanted you to go to regular confession, right? Because it, mm. as you say, it acts as this thing that's meant to kind of drill down in the, into the depths of those of those sins. If you're going to confession once a week and always confessing the exact same sins over and over again, right? If if the 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 Holy Spirit uses that. Right mm -hmm. to start to reveal things to you to show you what's going on. Right is is that is that fair to say in your experience? That's yeah, it is. It is. It helps you find those roots. I mean, it's you know, it, it's like a tree. And Dr. Bob Schutz is a friend of mine, the JP Two Healing Center. He talks about this a lot. But you know, you have sort of this illustration of a tree in your life, and you know, you go to confession, you can walk by and pick an apple, and that apple is sin X, whatever it is in your life, and you can go in confession and just kind of hand it to a priest and say, here's here it is. I want to confess this and I want, you know, to be forgiven. You walk back by the tree and the apple's already back there, right? And it's going to be back there because that is just the manifestation of things below the surface. So you flip the page in his Be Healed book. It's a great book. You know, if you're ever looking for anything on this further, um, you, the next page shows the root system below it. And every plant out there has a tap root. So it has all these roots, but there's one root that feeds all the rest of it. That one root is generally whatever wound you have in your life or whatever issue that's unhealed that manifests out in these sins. And so the only way that we can get to that root is to go and continue to, to talk with a priest and to, and to go to confession and to continue to grow in that relationship. Because here's the thing, going to confession is another way that we come into a greater knowledge of who Jesus is. And when we come into a greater knowledge of who him and God the Father is, we come into a greater knowledge of who we are beloved sons, not a wretch, not a loser, not a waste of space, but a beloved son who's been given gifts, who has dignity, right? And so when we start to hear that, 
then we start to build a relationship with Christ and his father. And just like any other relationship in your life, you don't set out and want to hurt your spouse. You don't want to hurt your children. You want to hurt your best friend. Sometimes you accidentally do. But the more you're going to confession, the more you're opening up about these things, the more love you have for them because you're receiving that gift and that grace. The grace that's received through confession is God is giving you not only forgiveness, but he's He's renewing your strength and he's making you stronger so that you can avoid these near occasions of sin, as we like to say, and start getting past these things, starting to mature spiritually. And then it becomes down to like, I don't want to do that because I don't want to hurt God. Like, I don't want to hurt the one I love. You know, a lot of times we can think that temptation is sin, right? We think I did this there. I've already thought about it. So I might as well do it, right? I'm guilty because I thought about it. I looked at that woman in the wrong way. And so that means I'm guilty. No temptation. If temptation was sin, they would call it sin. They don't for a reason. It's a choice in our lives, right? Am I going to walk towards holiness and virtue and these things and make that decision this time? Or am I going to fall to these other things, vice and all this other stuff? So, Confession is just another way where the Lord is trying to draw you into himself. And, and like you said, I mean, he gave that power to the priest. It's all in scripture in several places of loosing and binding and, you know, giving them the power to do that. And so, yeah, it's a tremendous gift along with a lot of the other sacraments in the Catholic church. And I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for it. It changed my life. And, and I try to go now in my life, instead of going 11 years without going to confession. Now I go a couple times a month. And it's more of, I got to get there now if I, if I mess up real badly, because I don't want to leave any room in my life yeah. for sin to grow, right? You, you're okay with a white lie. You're okay with another white lie and another white lie and another white lie. And then it's a bigger sin and a bigger sin and a bigger sin. So confession is a way to just go and, and continue to renew yourself and, and, and to stay on that path towards virtue. <laughs> that's fantastic. And we could, of course, could talk about the other sacraments as well, the Eucharist and all yeah. these things that are, I mean, oh gosh, that's, in, that's incredible. That could be hours of a conversation sure. there too. I want to dig into this vulnerability and this idea of connecting with other men in this. I mean, we'd call this discipleship in a way in, in the evangelical world where, where I came from, right? And this was a big thing we'd do. We'd intentionally build these communities of, of men or of, of young adults or for women, the same kind of thing. And and journey together, right? To really be vulnerable and to build into each other and to seek God in different ways, just studying different things, reading and uh, watching things together. It's kind of funny that this isn't, you know, I became Catholic and this was kind of, what is this thing? No one, no one kind of heard of it. <laughs> but but <laughs> I'm glad that you know, you're doing the work that you're doing for, for one thing, for sure, in, in that area. But I want to talk about vulnerability because there's like you experienced, right? You begin to open up, you begin to build a place where you can be vulnerable with other people and suddenly everyone's opening up and you realize that everybody has these things that they're 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 keeping inside and, and holding inside and it's holding them back from becoming right who who God wants them to be. I I've known all kinds of people and unfortunately been been party to to scandals in the church where where even the clergy have held these things back and it of course the scandal erupts and it, it, it ruins lives in the in the wake of these things and if we had just been able to be more vulnerable right with, with each other oh, yeah. we we really could have maybe avoided some of these things that eventually bubble up and explode over but we could we could begin to be who christ wants us to be right and, and Amen. i want to talk about that and i want to contrast that with this 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 this, I don't know, toxic lie sometimes that we have to have it all together. And then we end that you mentioned Facebook, right? These pictures that we take that take hours to curate. <laughs> and that's what we often see from yeah. each other in the world, right? And that that's not reality, right? And those two things, that vulnerability and that kind of the facade that we we show the world. I mean, one thing is obviously deeply, deeply Christian. What what Christ wants us to be that that vulnerable you know, attachment to, to him and openness to each other and journeying together. And one is 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 such a lie from the devil. Yeah. Like, put it that way, John. No, you're exactly you're, right. You know, that's very charismatic of me. That's channeling my... You know, <laughs> it's a lie well, from the devil, John, but it's true, right? I mean, that's... that's. Yeah. I think it's true. That's what scripture calls him, the father of lies. You know, that's what he calls him, the accuser of our brothers. Yeah. That's what it says in scripture, you know, in John and then also in Revelation. And... The thing is, the devil wants to isolate you. He wants to convince you that you're the only person that has yeah, this yeah. issue. You're the only alcoholic. You're the only person that's watching porn. You're the only person that's doing drugs. The only person that 
talks to his wife in a way that's not appropriate so that you're shamed. And so you separate, right? It's like, it's like, you know, cowboys or, or an animal or something like a lion chasing uh, gazelles and, and making one veer off from the rest of them because they're easy to take down. They're going to kill it. And that's what the script, scripture says. Like the devil's prowling like a roaring lion waiting to devour you. So he convinces you of your guilt and your shame that God can't love you. And what happens is, you know, I was in a physical prison cell, but every one of us are in a virtual prison cell with four walls made up of our own sins, our own mistakes, our own failures, all our pains, all these things. And you go to open the door, much like I did in that room with those men, and the devil steps in between the door and you, and he starts poking and prodding, right? Up, you go out there, you're going to lose everything. Up, you go out there, you're going to find out about your porn problem. You're going to find out about your drug problem. You're going to find out about this. And so you let go of the door and you go, whoa, I can't, I can't. Like, there's nothing out there. He convinces you there's nothing outside of that door but pain and torture and loss, right? And, and so you just let go of the door and you sit there because it's comfortable. You know, one of my favorite quotes from Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, God's Rottweiler, you know, is, uh, you know, he says, the, the world offers you comfort, but you were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness. Yeah. Well, Satan convinces you that it's all right in there, right? Stay there. It's where it's comfortable. You out there are going to have loss, all that stuff. You're going to have to follow this Jesus and there's rules and there's all that. So you stay there. But when you become vulnerable in three different ways, really, this is when you're set free. First of all, with myself, I knew I had a drug problem when I was sitting there at two in the morning, slamming beers and doing all that, but I wouldn't admit it to myself. Oh, everybody does this. I'm just blowing off steam. You know, it's my thing. Other people do it other ways. When I was in that jail cell on my knees, I knew I had a problem, right? And a problem I couldn't fix myself. Jesus did something for me that I could not do for myself. I became vulnerable about my issue with myself first. Second of all, confession, like we talked about, took it to God, gave it to him, admitted it, what he already knew, but I admitted it and asked for mercy. And three, in the room with those men, I shared it with brothers, with other people. And it's like Jesus, I mean, Jesus sent the disciples out two by two for a reason. Because if one of them fell, there was another one there to pick them up. And so when you become vulnerable in those three ways and you go to open that door and the devil shows up and he goes sticking his finger in that wound, he finds there's not a wound there anymore. You know what I told people? I, I, I came to grips with it myself. God's forgiven me and others know and they still love me in spite of me. You have no power over me anymore. Because the devil lives in those wounds. He lives in those places. And as long as we try to cover them up and try to hide them, then we're always going to have a place for him in our lives and in our heart to live. And so what the root, the Latin root word of vulnerability is vulnus, which means wound. It literally means wound. So when we become vulnerable, we're actually opening up that wound where we as men and women want to just cover it, right? Because it's easier. We don't anybody touching it. It hurts. It's unsightly. It, but when we do that, we allow infection to set in and it, and it goes through our body and endangers our entire body and our soul. So we become vulnerable. We rip that scab off and you let the divine healer, the only one that can reheal it, God, the father and his son, Jesus Christ, heal that in us. There's a difference, though, between there's types of vulnerability. You don't want to go get on a parade float with a megaphone and yell, <laughs> I'm a huge porn addict out to everybody and their brother. It's not what I'm saying. We have to create these spaces yeah. in our parishes where we're with people that we trust. And unfortunately, so many of us, we want to do our faith on our own right? It's just me and Jesus. That's not what a personal relationship with Jesus means. You're supposed to have that, but it doesn't mean me and Jesus. We're the body of Christ, right? We need each other and, and we need to form together and walk with other people because you're going to need them. We need to stand shoulder to shoulder with, with fellow brothers or fellow sisters, whoever's listening to this. And, and the only way we do that is by just coming clean and casting off these chains and these lies of the devil so you can become who God wants you to be. It's like Jesus is trying to get in your heart, and he can't get in the door because there's so much junk in there that you've kept to yourself. And so you got to start opening the window of your heart and throwing the stuff out the window so Jesus can get in and start redoing the floor plan. Right. And when we allow him to do that, that's when our lives change. But it only happens through vulnerability. That's why St. Paul knew that. And when he started doing that, he's like, I'm only going to boast of my burdens and my weaknesses and my hardships because when I'm weak, I'm strong. Right. Yes, I am broken. Nothing wrong with that. There's a, there's, there's a God who loves me in spite of it. And that is so freeing. That is so freeing. People ask me all the time, don't you ever get tired? Or don't you get embarrassed to tell them this? No, because suffering is not for just me. It wasn't just for me and Angel to suffer. If it was, then it was useless. But this story, this pain, we share it with the world and it helps so many people, right? Like God loves us and uses us in so many ways. But we have to become vulnerable. We have to get this junk out of our life. 
and stop believing the lies of the world, the flesh, and the devil that you need to keep to yourself and that you're not worth anything because it's simply not true. God will show you that when you step out of that cell, there's not loss and, and torture and pain. There's joy and mercy and hope and love. That's all that waits for you. <laughs> John, this is a regular revival mission. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> like, like, we get the tent out and we'll get the, we'll get the folding <laughs> chairs and we'll just camp right. out here for a little bit. This is fantastic. Listen, I don't know if there's a good place to ever end this conversation, John. But sure. We could go on forever. And this is amazing stuff. We are on the edge of our seats listening to you. I, oh, I promise you. you. Nobody here is falling asleep. Nobody here is tuning out. They're going to hate me for ending this, but, but <laughs> we're going to have to have you back. And, sure. and there is much more they can listen to you, though, uh, mm -hmm. talk. you got your podcast. I, I, wanna, I do want to press pause on this and ask you to tell us where else people can go for more of this, because I, sure. I, I know they're going to want to, John. I'm wanting sure. to. I already listened to your podcast, but now I want more. <laughs> Thank you. Where, where do you want to point them towards to, to experience more of, of what you've given sure. us here? Sure. Well, the best place to go, I guess, would be the website. That's where everything is. So you can listen to the podcast on there. Like I said, we have 150-something episodes. Uh, my best friend, one of my best friends, Victor Adams, is my co-host, one of the guys from that men's group. Um, sometimes the deacon that helped me start it is on there. We do interviews. So we've had great interviews with Chris Stefanik and Matt Frad and a ton of people like that. Um, there, we have a YouTube channel that you can find there and subscribe to. We're actually building a studio now, as you and I were talking about, we're about to look good like you do, hopefully. <laughs> and, and we're going to have a lot of in-studio guests. I've been fortunate to meet a lot of other presenters and speakers. And so they're going to come in and do some of that, but you can listen to the podcast there. We have a program called The Narrow Road, the monthly guidebook. Guys can sign up for there, and it basically walks you through a different virtue every month, actually living it in the main relationships of your life with God, your wife, your kids, and your neighbor. And then the greatest thing that I think the Lord is having us do right now is parish missions. Um, there's just been so many people reaching out. We do a three-talk restored parish mission, which is my conversion story. Uh, there's a talk about restoring our identity, who I am, who God is, and what I'm here for, which most people struggle with. And then my last and favorite talk to give is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we give those. And then while on site, we actually have a format that we use in our men's group that we could talk about another time. But um, it is this is what we're going to do. And we're setting up and training men to lead other men. A lot of things don't do that. It's just here's a shiny box with my stuff. Get in a room, hit play, let the babysitter work. <laughs> but men don't grow that way, right? It's it's we need we need to be able to come together. And we have a format that helps them do that. You know, four pillars that have all sorts of different entry points for men who where no matter where they are in their faith to be able to come in and join the group and feel comfortable doing it. And then you put men together in that kind of brotherhood, and it changes not only the men, yeah. but the women are inspired, the children, and then you're changing a parish. So if you're interested in that at all, you can go to the book me page there on the site. And you can uh, send us something there, and then we can get talking to you about maybe coming to your area. That's fantastic. I'll put links to all those in the show notes, too. Thanks. I, I hate to end this, John. <laughs> this is so much fun. But yeah. I do want to say, oh, gosh, thank you. I mean, thank you for for the blessing you are to the church. Thank you for letting God use you in the way he is, because I, I guarantee you it's a blessing. Lots of people, John. So. God bless you in that. Thanks for being here. I think yeah. we'll have to have you on again because there's lots more we can unpack. Sure, I'd and, love uh, to. Yeah, and and thanks. Thanks for hanging out with us. God. Yeah, God. thank you. I mean, thank you for everything you're doing and, and uh, the beauty of your podcast and what you're doing for folks all over. So thank you too, man. It's, it's a joy to be in the vineyard working with uh, another person like yourself. Oh man. Well, 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 thank you so much. It's, it's great. Pulling weeds together. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah. Thank you.